And we build this box and we put Jesus in that box of Savior and Lord. And we, we take away any mystery, any majesty from him by seeing him just as Savior and Lord. And he absolutely, absolutely is Savior and Lord. Do not misunderstand me. But he's so much more than that. And so when we started the Gospel of John, we got to see immediately how not only is he Savior and Lord, but he's also the Logos, the divine word from creation. He's not only the Logos, but he's also the, the life and the life giver. He's not only the life and the life giver, but he's also the light. And then uh, a week or two later, we got to see that he is the true light. And so this image of Jesus just continues to be blown out of the box that we tend to put him in. And then last week I did something insane, and I tried to tackle five verses in one sermon. We were here for seven, eight hours. We eventually got through it. I'm repentant of it. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, I obviously, you know, I, I, I went for that 16-ounce steak, and I really shouldn't have. I should have just had the little bitty 8-ounce one. Um, so I'm repentant. I'm corrective. So this morning what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on one verse and one verse only that really highlights who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us, but again, busting outside of that box. And so we're going to look at John chapter 1, verse 14, one whole sentence. John chapter 1 verse 14, which talks about Jesus's glory. Glory. So I normally do a sermon in the sentence, sermon in a sentence, boil the whole sermon down to one sentence. That was very helpful when we tried to clog through five verses last week. But this morning, the sermon in the sentence is going to actually be the verse itself, because we're going to look at a sentence. So the sentence itself of scripture will be the sermon in the sentence. So if you will please look at John chapter 1 verse 14 with me please. John chapter 1 verse 14 in the New American Standard Version says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's John chapter 1, verse 14. It's the scripture verse, and it's also the sermon in a sentence, my friends. We're just going to roll through this. We're going to take it phrase by phrase is what we're going to do. So I put in bold, uh, capital letters, the first two phrases because that's what I want to focus in on. I want to focus in on the idea of the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I capitalized all those letters. They're not capitalized in anybody else's Bible. I did that for emphasis, a little Jamar effect, as it were. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's a powerful, powerful idea, my friends. The Word is the divine truth that is Jesus, the Logos, who is the agent of creation, Jesus not only spoke the word that created the universe, but he was the word that was also spoken. Mind-blowing. And we have here, at the beginning of verse 14, the idea of Christmas and Emmanuel, where God comes to dwell among humanity. So you have the perfect, the pure, divine truth coming to live among us as one of us. So he becomes the God-man. 100% God and 100% human. So he grew in normal wisdom and understanding. He had physical growing pains. He had a belly button. He had the whole deal. God had to join humanity in order to make the sacrifice work. God required death and blood for the forgiveness of our sins, evil, and wickedness. And yet, we are sinful, evil, and wicked, therefore we could not die for that. The sacrifice had to be innocent, pure, perfect. And the only way to achieve that was with Emmanuel. God came among us in order to be the sacrifice in our stead. So Jesus dying on the cross, he's being the sinless sacrifice for us covering our sins, providing divine forgiveness, bridging the gap between you and I, the created, and the 
pure creator. It was a beautiful sacrifice for our benefit. And that's only possible because the word came to dwell among us. But it, it's even better than that. Because God came to dwell, us in, uh, dwell among us in order to have a sympathetic high priest. This comes straight out of Hebrews. Mike did a great job going through Hebrews. He did it paragraph by paragraph. I think it took him three weeks to get through one chapter, which now, after experiencing me for a month, you realize is really highway kind of speed. You know, um, we're, you know we're, we're 14 verses in, and it's been you know, three months now or something. That's what it feels like. Jesus, Jesus is able to be a sympathetic high priest because he has lived a human life. He had mom and dad. He had homework and chores. He had a curfew. He had friends. He had to work for a living. He had friends that betrayed him. And therefore, he's able to sympathize with us. He's able to connect with what we are dealing with. So when you go to Jesus Christ, the ultimate high priest, he has an emotional connection with us because he's been through it. He's been through it. So that's also important with Emmanuel. And the third one is Emmanuel, the word, the divine logos coming among us is important because Jesus is the ultimate example for us. We don't have some God who has never suffered hunger or cold or betrayal or violence or deadlines. So that when we're looking for an example of how to live, we can go to Jesus and see how did he handle this situation. How did he handle a situation when someone asked him to do something he didn't want to do? How did he handle a situation where people were saying lies about him? How did he handle the situation when his friends betrayed him? How did he handle a situation when he went from being surrounded by his posse to being all by himself? How did he handle that situation? We can look to him as an example and follow his perfect example. This only happens because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel makes it all possible. And it's where this verse starts before it moves on to glory, grace, and truth. Jesus is the Logos, the Word, the absolute divine truth. Let's look at the Sermon on the Sentence and also verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. We saw His glory. We often sing about glory. God's glory, and we do that rightly. We should. It actually comes from Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Revelation chapter 4 is a glimpse into heaven, and when they glimpse heaven in Revelation chapter 4, they see worship. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says this song of praise, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they exist and were created worthy is the lord glory honor and power and that echoes through our hymns and our praise chorus it echoes our prayers and it's right and proper worship it is glorious to be in the presence of the lord and we are to praise and worship his name for who he is. Now you know already that John can't sing. I I can't. I will never be asked to be on the worship team to sing. I just won't. Um, In fact, if I want to empty a room, that's my go-to. I start singing, people run. It's just this, I have this fascination with karaoke. I have this fascination with karaoke. And yet, I've never, ever sung karaoke at all. It's like one of those things. It's like, I'd like to do it, but I know it would be a disaster, right? Um, So, I worship and praise God. Give worthy are you, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. I do that in prayer. There's many ways to worship the Lord. You can do it in song. You can do it in prayer. You can do it in thought. You can do it in writing. You can worship, worship, worship. But we often talk about the glory of God 
like is in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, and John chapter 1, verse 14. But we never actually ask, what is glory? What does that word mean? When you say, receive glory, honor, and power, what are you articulating? What does glory mean? So let me define glory for you. Glory is the majestic image of God. It's literally his, his being. We would say God's magnificence or God's splendor. We use it in a much weaker way for royalty. And we talk about a king or queen's dignity and majesty, being in the glorious presence of Queen Elizabeth the 37th or whatever, which I'm not sure she's human because she's 300 years old, right? She's a, uh, she's a cyborg or something. Uh, Right? She, she goes all the way back to the 1800s, so she can't be human. It's the idea of, of meeting somebody and being in awe. You know, uh, wow. Being in somebody's presence and being rendered speechless. Has that ever happened to you where you met somebody and you were rendered speechless? You had like an agenda. You were going to ask for their autograph and tell them how great whatever it was and you ended up instead blubbering (laughs) and they just look at you and, you know. I've met some, I've met some famous people and, and I've met some powerful people. I've met some gorgeous people. And for the life of me, I can't come up with one person that I've had a glorious encounter with that left me wow, awe, and speechless, except one person, and I was smart enough to marry her. That ought to get me out of dishes, right? (laughs) Something like that. Yeah. You know, have you ever had that encounter where you met somebody and you were just rendered speechless? It's like, oh. That's the reaction we're supposed to have to God in His glory, so that His glory, His being, His presence renders us speechless. Our brain goes numb, our knees get weak, we kind of fall down and drool on ourselves because He is so magnificent. That's the glory of the Lord. It's really incomparable to anything we've ever experienced people to people people to people god's glory is so awesome that it can it can cause a person to radiate light right exodus chapter 34 moses goes into god's presence and god is laying down the law And Moses is like, hey, nobody's seen you. Can I see you? And God pretty much says, if you see me, you die. I'll tell you what, you hide in this little crook of a rock, and I'll cover you up, and you can can see me through the periphery of your eye. And when Moses comes down from the mountain to join the people again, His face is shining with this light that's, talk about extraterrestrial alien, right? Um, It freaks everybody out. They're like, what? What has happened to this guy? We know Moses. We've known him for 40 years. Why is his face doing this? So he had to wear a veil to cover up his face in order to turn off the nightlight that was the glow of the Lord on him. Because it was freaking people out. That's the reflected glory of the Lord, as it were. A powerful idea. And of course, when you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about how people still wear a veil over their face when they read Moses. So they do not see, they do not understand what God is doing even now because they still wear the veil of Moses, covering up the glory of God reflected. 
So they're just, they are trying to understand, but they're ignorant. And then verses 17 and 18 says that because we have received Jesus Christ, we do not have a veil. We don't have the veil. The veil of Moses has been removed from us in Jesus Christ. And instead of a veil, the glory of the Lord that the veil was protecting the people from now moves us from glory to glory, moves us from glory to glory. It's all about transformation so that we bask in the glory of the Lord and the more we bask in the glory of the Lord, we increase in levels, we increase in growth in the glory of the Lord. It's about the spiritual journey, going from glory to glory to glory in the presence of the Lord. Transformation. It's a horrible thing that so many people are willing to stay with the law of Moses and live their entire existence with the veil on. They don't get it. They're willingly wearing blinders, and therefore they don't see God. And praise Jesus Christ that we are delivered from that so that we can see Jesus. We can experience God day by day by day. And not just static on the same level, but as 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, we can move from glory to to glory. We can mature. We can spiritually evolve. We can grow. And that's what I'm afraid that we fall short, my friends. I'm just telling you what you already know. And that is way, way too many followers of Jesus are content to be infants in Jesus Christ. They're content to be level one Christians instead of being level 100 Christians. We're just content having our get out of jail free card. I'm baptized, sanctified, redeemed in the blood. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life, so hell is not my destination. Now, God, just leave me alone. When I'm in a major crisis, I will look for you. That's when I expect you to show up and, you know, be my magic genie. But don't ask me to mature in my faith. Don't ask me to grow, to be greater and greater in my godliness. Don't ask me to do anything sacrificial or selfless. Because those make me uncomfortable. And I'm not in this for you, God, to make me uncomfortable. Aren't we surrounded by Christians like that? If we dare pause for a second, my friends, and ask Jesus about our own spiritual growth, ask him, Lord, am I more spiritually mature this January than I was in January 2020, than I was in January 2019? Have I experienced any spiritual growth? And I'm afraid that that mere process is incredibly convicting. And the Holy Spirit convicts us that we've gone a decade with no spiritual growth. We've gone three decades. Coming to worship service every Sunday, going to Sunday school, reading our Bible, and not growing at all so that we're still at level one or level two. And when we encounter any kind of spiritual challenge that is of the higher levels, we are overwhelmed. And then blame the devil. <laughs> That's us. That's us. And you know it's us. That's what's wrong with the American church. What am I talking about? I'm talking about discipleship. That's what this verse is really talking about. Discipleship, transformation by the Spirit. And it is true, spiritual growth is spiritual, and spiritual growth is relational. 
Absolutely. It's spiritual and it's relational between you and me and God. It's how we relate to Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit moves us forward, yes, but it's also about us together, where you and I are connected relationally and spiritually. Iron sharpening iron so that I help you grow spiritually and you help me grow spiritually. And we're in this together so that when one of us falls behind and we're moving in spiritual maturity and people are being left behind, it's our fault. The church is great at leaving the wounded behind and the immature behind. And we blame them for it. Instead of saying it's actually our fault, it's our responsibility to pick them up and carry them along. We're the Marines. We're not supposed to let any man behind. We're not supposed to leave any man behind. And yet we do, and we have for thousands of years. When I say discipleship, you think of classrooms or this. And it's true. It starts with knowledge. You have to know God. You have to understand his word. That's step one in discipleship. But if all you ever do is memorize facts about the Bible, you are still a level one or level two Christian. And God wants you to be 98 and a level 99, and you are settling for head knowledge. It starts in the classroom. It starts here. But it's about living our lives in faith, taking leaps of faith, doing things that are selfless and sacrificial and defy our culture, living in such a way that the non-believers around us go, are you crazy? And you say, yes, crazy for the Lord. That's the process. It starts in the classroom, but it's 99% outside of the classroom, my friends. It's like studying the driver's manual. Hey, I got my Utah driver's license. I passed the test. You know, it's a 25-question test, and I got 24 out of 25 right. And the little test said, uh, you push this button to see what question you got wrong. And I kind of looked at it and went, why would I care what question I got wrong? I passed. You know, uh, yeah, so I just I've moved on. You know, It's like studying the driver manual and never getting behind the wheel of any car. That's what we are guilty of in discipleship. We learn the theory and we reject the application. And that is not living for Jesus. It's just not. We got to do better than that. It's about the application. Let us walk every moment of every day like the apostles with Jesus. Receive his empowerment and look for opportunities to live by faith, not by sight. Live radical, trusting God lifestyles, expecting the miraculous, and then giving testimony of what our miraculous God has done. That's the Christian life that's supposed to be the normal instead of the extraordinary. Shame on us that what is the Bible projects as a normal life is really an extraordinary life in our present culture. Let's change that. We can do it. We absolutely can do it. Have you beheld Jesus' glory? where you were speechless, in awe, wowed by him. Even better yet, how has it transformed you? How are you living radical Jesus life? That's the question that you need to answer. That's the questions to ask on the ride home. Have and how, have and how. Let somebody start a conversation with you around those two ideas. And the word became flesh, the sermon sentence and verse 14. 
and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The only begotten from the Father is the next phrase that I want to focus in on. The only begotten from the Father. And boy, the, the, the children's message like, like totally took this part of the sermon. Who knew that Eleanor was a, an expert on the Trinity? She did a fantastic job there, and I really want to figure out where those dots came and went. I, I got to find that out. It's like she's a sorcerer or something. I'm a little worried about that. But she really explained the Trinity, and this verse has the idea of the Trinity, the only begotten from the Father. The Father and the Son right here is connected to the Word. The Logos is the Son, absolutely. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is one God in three persons. They share an essence. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we've heard that before. And we've said that before. What messes with our head is their role. What role does the members of the Trinity serve? They kind of each individually have their own function, if you will. One God, three persons, absolutely. They are all equal, but they have a different purpose. God the Father, his job is he's the planner. He's the planner. He's got the 10-year plan. He's, got, he, he, he's, he's the guy who plans it out. So he planned the Old Testament, New Testament, the arrival of Jesus out. He's the planner. He's the big picture guy. Maybe you're a big picture guy, or you've got a big picture guy in your life. You know how nice that is and how annoying that is, right? A big picture guy. So that's the Father. The Father plans it all out. Jesus Christ, the divine Son, who was always the divine Son, who came and dwelt among us as the God-man, 100% God, 100% man, Jesus Christ executes the plan. Jesus Christ is the one who goes through the steps that the Father has laid out. I don't do anything that the Father hasn't told me to do. Right? So the Father lays out the plan. Jesus Christ walks through the steps of the plan. He's executing the plan. He's doing what he's supposed to do to make the Father's plan to succeed. So he's the guy whose feet on the ground, which is why he's such a perfect example for you and I, which is why he's a, a sympathetic high priest, is because he has gone through life just like we are going through life. And so he executes the plan. God the Father lays out the plan. Jesus executes the plan. And then the invisible Holy Spirit, the dot underneath her fingers, right? Which wasn't there, but then was there. It's so confusing. The Holy Spirit applies the results. The Father plans it, the Son executes it, and the Holy Spirit applies it. So it is the Holy Spirit that applies divine forgiveness into our lives. It's the Holy Spirit who counsels us. It's the Holy Spirit who teaches us. It's the Holy Spirit that dwells within me so that all of the Holy Spirit lives in each of us and guides us into that which is the will of God. The Holy Spirit applies it. The Son executes it. And the Father plans it, just like Eleanor said during the kids' message. See, I, I spent too much time on it. It was just a repeat. I can just move on, right? The Trinity, she did such a good job. That's fantastic. Let's go back to verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14, which is also the sermon in the sentence. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and and truth. That's the phrase, the last phrase that we're going to focus in on. It's not full of grace and not full of truth. It's full of grace and full of truth. You know, that's the way that phrase lays out. Let's, let's roll through this phrase as well. Just as we use glory without defining it, we use grace without defining it as well. So we talk about God's grace without actually explaining what grace means. When we think of grace outside of the Bible, you either think it's somebody's name, it's a girl's name, right? Or it's connected somehow to dancing or being uh, dexterous, right? She, she has a lot of grace or he has a lot of grace. 
and neither of which um, does those apply to what the New Testament talks about when it comes to grace. So let's define grace first. Grace means free favor. Free favor. A favor done without any kind of expectation of return. A free favor, a gift. God's free favor. It's just a gift. It's doing something out of the generosity of your own heart with nothing in return expected. That's what God did for us. So that by God's grace, Jesus came to live among us. By God's grace, Jesus lived a sinless life. By God's grace, Jesus died on the cross. By God's grace, he spent three days in the grave. It's by God's grace that he rose from the dead. Free favor from God to you and I. And we see it in salvation. We see it when forgiveness and freedom is given. Forgiveness and freedom is given. So when I see the word grace in the New Testament, I always think free favor, because that's just a little more descriptive for me. Ephesians chapter 2 makes it very clear that it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So that grace, that gift idea, that free favor, is how we come into a relationship with God. It's that grace, that free favor, that gift, that our sins are forgiven. That's why it's not about works. It's not about earning anything. It's simply about receiving something, receiving grace. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I was having a conversation this week with Jeff, and uh, Jeff was telling me about a time he received grace, unearned free favor, a gift. Jeff was telling me that he was traveling across country from the East Coast back this way, and he had to go to Arizona in order to get one of his, uh, his cancer treatments, right? But he was going to arrive in Arizona a full week before his cancer treatment was available. And so he didn't have a place to stay. You can imagine trying to spend a, like a week in a hotel in Phoenix. I mean, that sounds pretty horrible. And so a distant friend of the family, just a friend of the family named Sally, offered up an empty house to him. An empty house to him. Ah, huh, you just, if you're going to be here for a week, you come, you stay in this empty house. It won't cost you anything. You just crash there. You be at home. It, it'll be far more relaxing than some kind of hotel. Just let me take care of you. That's grace. That's a free favor. How beautiful is that? When Jeff told me that story, it reminded me of, a, of an event in my own life. I had a friend named Bob who got expelled out of high school. He got kicked out of high school, suspended. He earned it. In the process of getting expelled, expended, his, uh, let's just say his dad overreacted and kicked him out. So not only does he get kicked out of high school, <coughs> poor Bob, but he is also homeless. So here we have a homeless, troubled teen. And my friend Dean, Dean's parents took Bob in. We got a spare room. You come stay with us. And Bob stayed there for a year? For a year. He got back into school. He eventually went into the army. He's airborne, was airborne. Can you imagine having a teenage boy in your house and having a teenage delinquent that needs a place to stay and inviting the teenage delinquent into your house to sleep in the bedroom next to your good son? Now that is grace. Free favor. They didn't ask anything from Bob. Anything at all. And kept him out of getting into a whole lot more trouble. A whole lot more trouble. Bob. For some reason, the examples of grace and free favor 
seem to always connect to hospitality. I imagine that's probably the easiest example for us all. Can you think of a time where someone was gracious, gave you free favor in your life? Maybe a time you experienced unearned, unexpected hospitality that really met a need? That's an example of grace then in your life. Or maybe you were an instrument of grace by showing that kind of hospitality to somebody unearned and unexpected. So God worked in and through your life and used you as his instrument to free favor. Maybe that changed somebody's life. What a beautiful thing. Grace. We are only here because of God's grace. Praise the Lord. Second Peter. Second Peter says this. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, there's that word, both now and to the day of eternity. Grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So just in in case you think that having received grace, you're good. I have some bad news for you. Second Peter has an present active imperative command. I just went all grammar geek on you. That's okay. You were thinking about kittens. Um, Grow is a command we are supposed to obey every day. So every day you and I get a chance to either obey or rebel against the word. The word says every day we are to choose to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So every day we're supposed to be growing in grace and knowledge. That's leveling up. That's the spiritual maturity process. That's growing in intimacy with the Lord and growing in applied faith to our lives. Growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord. And that implies relationship and application. Stretching those muscles, as it were, and doing something awesome. Grow in grace. It's all connected, my friends. Have you received God's grace? The gift has been offered to you. Forgiveness of your sins, evil and wickedness. All you have to do is receive it. A free favor. For by grace you have been saved through faith. If that's not you, receive that gift now because we're not guaranteed the ride home. Accept it now and have that transformation before another heartbeat goes by because your life may end today and you may face judgment before you have another chance. Surrender to God's grace. And then for us, who have received God's grace, whether it was last week, last decade, or last millennia, are you growing in grace? Are you growing in grace? Or are you stagnant in grace? Let us be full of grace, like Jesus Christ. Full of grace, full of truth. We've looked at glory we've looked at grace now let's look at truth my friends let's define it like anything else whoops push buttons full of truth this is not the word logos which is divine absolute truth that's one kind of truth jesus is logos the word the absolute divine truth this is the truth of reality how it really is Reality. Reality, straightforwardness, sincerity. It's it's the truth of the idea, as it were. It's the truth of facts um, versus superstition and falsehood. The reality. We need to have a truthful view of reality. I believe some crazy things, my friends. I believe that God created the universe and the huge expanse of light and space. He created it in six days. 
I believe he created the smallest atoms and cells, electrons and neutrons, at the same time in six glorious days of Genesis chapter 1. I believe that the physical universe that we experience now is inferior to the invisible spiritual universe. I think the invisible spiritual universe is more real than the physical universe that we are experiencing now. Because I believe that there are angels and demons. I believe there is an invisible God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he has a real enemy, Satan, the devil, who is trying to destroy us because we belong to the other side. That's reality and that's truth. And from a non-biblical, non-Christian point of view, that's insane. Because I believe in the invisible. But it's only insane if the invisible is not real. If the invisible is real. And if you don't believe in the invisible reality of God, heaven, hell, angels, and the devil, you have been deceived. Galatians chapter 2 verse 5 talks about truth and the truth of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ only makes sense in a true understanding of reality, that there is the physical universe and the spiritual universe. The devil wins if he can get you to deny that. Satan, the devil, is the father of lies according to John chapter uh, chapter 8 verse 44. And the devil, Satan, is trying to convince us of things that are not true. If he can make you believe a lie about yourself, he has sidelined you. If he can make you believe a lie about yourself, he has taken a soldier off of the field. If he can make you believe a lie about yourself and your life, if you buy into the lie of the enemy, he has won a small battle. That's what he's about. That's what he's about. And you and I both know that the greatest lies we believe are lies about ourselves and our own life. We believe lies like we are unworthy. We believe lies like what I do does not matter. We believe lies that my life can't make an impact for eternity. We believe lies that your job, your family, and your retirement is more important than heaven, hell, and the millions and millions of people who will die and be punished for all eternity because we didn't put our priorities straight. The lies that we believe, my friends, take us off the field. All because we don't believe the truth, the reality, that you are a child of God and that you are special and you are destined for greatness. Greatness. Remember, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. That's the truth of reality. The physical universe and the spiritual universe. Who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you. It's liberating. Because all of a sudden you have a proper perspective. You know what's truly valuable. And you can step up and you can do it, my friends. Liberty. If you don't buy into the truth, you aren't free. Too many voices are complaining about worrying that Washington, D.C. is taking away our freedoms when we have surrendered our freedoms to the devil because we reject the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, but because I speak the truth, you don't believe me. It's one thing to believe lies about yourself that's just crippling. Jesus' example to us is he was a man of integrity. And we need to be people of integrity who speak the truth, even if the people around us don't believe it. To be a person of integrity now is to be a superhero. You want to make a radical, radical difference? 
from the people around you, you be a person of integrity in a world of lies. People don't even care if you're a person of integrity. The lawyers have cinched it up. Lawyers and accountants make integrity meaningless. You do not have to be a person of your word because I will just sue you. We don't even expect a person to be a person of their word. So it's easy to say anything, to agree to anything, because none of it matters. And if you want to be different, you'll stand up and you'll speak the truth. We lie because it's convenient. We lie to defend ourselves so we don't get hurt. We lie to make ourselves look good. But to say the truth when it makes us look bad, to say the truth when it causes us pain and suffering, that's doing something Jesus-like. And that requires a higher level of spirituality than most believers have. I like hunting. And I went waterfowl hunting right there on the border of the Arctic Ocean. And we went and shot geese, lesser Canadians, as they came in from the water onto shore to feed at dawn. And mixed in with the lesser Canadians is a bird you've never heard of called brant, B-R-A-N-D-T, brant. Um, They have a little white triangle on them. And brant are just fantastic. You can only hunt them, I think, in two places in the world. One's in Mexico and one's in Alaska. And you're allowed to shoot two a day, two brant a day. And I went waterfowl hunting with two 12-year-old boys. Um, Let's call them John and Nate. So geese are flying in, me and two 12-year-old boys. The geese are low. We are excited. Shotgun shells are going off. It's like the enemy's attacking us with a, you know, bombs. We're just blowing things out of the sky. Birds are falling. We're very excited. Then the birds all disappear, like waterfowl tend to disappear, and we start gathering up the birds we have dropped. There's three of us. How many brant can we have? Six. We find seven. Seven brant have been killed. One over the limit. Fish and wildlife will confiscate everything that we own on this trip. They will take my truck, They will take our guns. We will not be able to hunt for a very long time, not to mention the fines. But they will confiscate everything that we have. I'm with two 12-year-old boys. There's just the three of us at the end of the um, wilderness there. I see a teaching moment. I go all dad on them. Uh Uh-oh. All right, we know what's at stake. What? do we do boys what do we do nate says push that one in the mud gone we only have six smart boy he's yeah he's going places john said Let's first breast it out. Let's not waste waste the meat. Cut the meat off and then push the carcass into the uh, mud. You know, he he didn't want to waste any of the meat. Uh, He's going places, right? All right, yeah. Not one of them suggested being a man of integrity. So I suggested, well, how about we do the above and beyond right thing? And let's gather up all our birds, go back to the truck, drive into town, and our, the head of the Fish and Wildlife Law Enforcement, his name was Rick, said, we'll go to Rick and we'll tell him what we did. Ranger Rick, yeah. The boys were freaked out. I don't want to lose my gun. I don't want to lose my waders. I'm losing a truck. I don't know what they were talking about. You know, who's going to get the $10,000 fine? It's going to be me. So we go back. Um, we're, we're in my house, and I call Rick up at home. I call him at home. Rick, this is what we did. We're guilty. You tell us what to do. We will do it. The boys are like shaking. I'm shaking. I didn't tell my wife. You know, <clears throat> that's why I'm shaking. Rick says this, well... 
those rules are really to prevent poaching. And obviously what you did is an accident. So you did the right thing by telling me, no consequences, have a good day. I was blown away. I actually went, are you sure, Rick? That doesn't, um, you know, uh, it's like, yep, no problem, no problem at all. You don't want me to bring you the bird? No, nope, no, nope, it's all good. Okay, thank you, Ranger Rick. Boys, did we learn a good lesson, right? Um, I don't know if it had a long-term effect on them or not, but I sure hope it did. Imagine an opportunity then to speak the truth. To speak the truth by saying I am guilty. To speak the truth that had severe consequences. To speak the truth that affected others with negative consequences. I'm just glad that story worked out. (laughs) Truth. We don't live in a culture of truth anymore, and we haven't for decades and decades and decades. We're comfortable with lies. We're so comfortable with lies that the truth makes us uncomfortable. If somebody says they're going to be there at 10 o'clock, we're shocked when they're there at 10 o'clock. It just amazes us. When somebody says they're going to do something and they don't do it, it's normal instead of being men and women of truth. The Holy Spirit is described not only as a member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who applies all this stuff. But according to John chapter 14, verse 7, and 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth who counsels, instructs, and guides us. You know where the Spirit is leading you if the Spirit is leading you in truth. You know where the enemy is leading you if he's leading you in lies. Let lying be so uncomfortable that you view it as cancer. That it'll eat your living cells and destroy you from within. And let's be so embracing of truth and integrity that our children, our employees, our friends and family will say, well, you know what? You may not like this person, for some reason, but they're a person of integrity. You can trust and believe everything that person says. They say they'll do it, they'll do it. Isn't that what we want our children and grandchildren to grow up to be? And yet we surrender integrity to the father of lies. And then we wonder when we try to speak truth to the next generation, they don't believe us because we've lost our integrity. We've lost our integrity. May the Holy Spirit guide and direct us, counsel and instruct us in truth and spiritual growth so that we can glorify God more, so that we can grow in grace more, so that we can be men and women of integrity. Have you received Jesus in glory, grace, and truth? If not, receive him now asking him to forgive you of your sins and come into your life. And then let's commit now to live every single moment of every single day in God's glory, grace, and truth, my friend. The decision is yours. What are you going to do about it? Will you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne and we thank you for your glory, your divine truth, your grace, and for calling us to be people of truth with the Holy Spirit, guiding and directing us in truth. We love you, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you would convict us of our sin. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might be able to live lives that give you honor and glory. And Father, I pray that you would grow us, level us up, so we can be the men and women of faith you would have us be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to do communion this morning, and we're going to do communion this morning with one deacon under COVID.